Good morning, First Coleraine, and good morning to the congregations of Drumacos and Darramore. And good morning to everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to our online broadcast. And thank you to everyone who's taking part. This week's announcements are again on our Facebook page and on our website. Can I remind the elders of Drumacos and Derrimore of our meeting on Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m.? I'll send the link at the beginning of the week. Just a reminder to all of our young people that our online Youth and Children's Weekend is coming up next week. You should have received information about it in your gift pack, but if you haven't received those details yet, please get in touch with Stephen. And finally, we do hope to return to worship in our church buildings on Easter Sunday, God willing. Listen out next week for more details. Let us worship God. Our call to worship for this year comes from John chapter 10 and verse 10. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the beauty of your creation and for the hope that springtime gives us. As we see the buds open, the lambs in the fields and feel the warmth of the springtime sun. We thank you for the hope of better days ahead, for the much welcome news this week of pupils returning to their classrooms, that as a church family we too can soon meet together for Sunday worship and for the hope of increased contact as we gently begin the journey out of lockdown. We thank you for the even greater hope that we have when we put our trust in you, the living hope that is ours, not of our own doing, but one for us through Christ's death and resurrection. In this we are confident in all your promises and for the hope that one day we will receive our inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Lord, we ask that you help us to hold fast to this hope that we profess. Forgive us, Lord, when our actions and our words fall short and we choose to look within ourselves or to the world when we should be looking to you. Lord, your word tells us to cast our cares upon you. So we come now confident in your loving care for each of us. We pray for your blessing on all our children and young people, teachers and support staff. Help them as they once again begin a return to school life. Remove any anxieties that they may have. And we ask that you guard over them and help them to settle quickly so they can enjoy all the blessings of each day at school. We pray for the online children's and youth ministry planned for this weekend. We ask for a good response to these well-planned programs and that you speak through the leaders into these young lives so that the children and young people will come to put their trust in you and find for themselves the sure and certain hope that only you can give. We pray for many in our church families who are experiencing times of difficulty, illness, separation or loss. We ask that you place your hand upon them to give them comfort, strength and your peace in their hearts at this time. We remember those who are involved in the caring and support of their loved ones. Bless them, Lord, and give them all the help and resources needed to them. We pray for our pastoral care team as they faithfully continue to keep in contact and care for others. We pray that relationships are being strengthened and trust that you're building your church in ways unknown to us. <clears throat> So as we hear your word being read and explained to us this morning, we pray that you will open our hearts to receive the message that it brings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. The parable of the wheat. 
Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did all these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it down to my barn.
at his wedding, my friend told me that I was the worst, best man that he had ever seen. Honestly, I was speechless. Every generation thinks that the world is getting worse, doesn't it? And certainly there are some things happening in our world today that would have left older generations speechless. But is the world really getting worse? I came across a little poem that goes, My granddad, viewing earth's worn cogs, said things were going to the dogs. His granddad, in his house of logs, said things were going to the dogs. And his granddad, in the Flemish bogs, said things were going to the dogs. And his granddad, in his old skin tog, said things were going to the dogs. There's one thing I have to state. The dogs have had a good long wait. (laughs) This is our little series in Matthew chapter 13 called, What on Earth is Happening? And we discovered that by chapter 13 of Matthew, questions had been raised about who Jesus really was and what on earth he was doing. Even John the Baptist wasn't sure anymore. Jesus didn't seem to be the type of Messiah that people had been expecting. He wasn't the person they were hoping for. What had happened to the overthrow of the Roman Empire? And what about establishing Israel as a great nation once again? All Jesus had done was collect a tiny band of miserable disciples, fishermen and tax collectors. What could they ever achieve? And not only that, the dogs on the street knew that those in authority were plotting his murder. What on earth was Jesus doing? So in response, Jesus told these parables of the kingdom. And we discovered last week that Jesus taught in parables for a reason so that the eyes and ears would be closed. The eyes and ears of Israel. Old Testament prophecy would be fulfilled. Those who didn't want to see the Messiah would not see the Messiah. Those who wanted to reject Jesus would have their rejection confirmed. And as their hearts hardened toward Jesus, the cross would be guaranteed But the cross would only be the beginning. Last week in the first parable, Jesus told us about the growth of the kingdom, that there would be one day a great harvest, in fact, an incredible, unimaginable harvest. One day, gathered before the throne of God, there would be gathered people from every country, every language, outnumbering the sand on the shore and the stars in the sky. And what a great encouragement that is. When we despair about the state of the world, we're to remember that all is well in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what the world and the flesh and the devil do, the great king has sown his word in the world and a great harvest is coming. But what about the state of our world? What on earth is happening? How should we view it? This week, we find that Jesus told them another parable in verse 24. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Now, have a quick look at the next verses. If you were with us for our Bible study on Wednesday evening, you'll already know what comes next. Jesus tells us this parable, but then, just like last week, before he gives the explanation, there's an interruption. Matthew Matthew records two other parables and gives another quotation from the Old Testament. And again, this is not Matthew going off on a tangent, a wee interlude before we get to the meaning of the parable. This is central to what he's telling us. The two extra parables are, are really short. The parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the yeast in the dough. We'll come back to them in a moment. But have a look at the quotation from the Old Testament. It isn't from the prophet Isaiah this time. This time it's from the Psalms. Psalm 78. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Now, I know that you're familiar with that verse. 
Psalm 78 is often the passage that ministers turn to when they're training Sunday school teachers and youth leaders. But maybe you're not familiar with the rest of the psalm. There's no doubt that the opening verses of Psalm 78 are inspiring, but the rest of the psalm is pretty depressing. It's a psalm about how Israel rejected God, even after all he had done for them. Again and again and again, God blessed them and took care of them. But again and again and again, the people hardened their hearts. And the psalm goes on and on with a litany of betrayal. In fact, nearly 64 verses of it. And yet, God seems to do nothing about it. He's silent. And evil seems to prosper. Until finally, in verse 65, God stirs. It's as if he'd been asleep. You, you know the way that it feels when you're facing some problem or difficulty and God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. He seems silent. But then in verse 65, all of a sudden, at the end of this psalm, God acts. He hasn't been asleep. He knows everything that has been going on. And his response is to reveal his true king who comes to reign with righteousness. Do you see what we're being told? We're being told what on earth is happening. That it might seem at times that evil is flourishing, unabated. It might even feel that God is asleep at the wheel. But actually, nothing could be further from the truth. And in a way, the two little parables that Matthew gives us are a kind of summary of Jesus' teaching so far, a summary of the two big parables. In the parable of the mustard seed, from the tiniest of beginnings, we're told that the kingdom will grow to an unimaginable size, just like in the parable of the sower. But at the same time as that incredible growth, there will be something else happening. The parable of the yeast in the dough reminds us that as the kingdom flourishes, evil will flourish alongside it. In the Bible, yeast is never a symbol of anything that is good. And once yeast gets mixed with the dough, it can't be separated, it can't be removed. It works its way through the whole batch. The yeast and the dough, in a sense, grow together. So let's take a look at what has become known as the parable of the weeds or the parable of the wheat and the tares. And yes, it's called that. Even though Jesus says here in verse 24 that the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. The focus, the main focus of the parable is yet again on the sower. And not only that, but we're also told that the sower is actually the owner of the field. And not only that, but we're told in verse 37 that the owner of the field is the son of man. Now, that's a title from the book of Daniel, a title that Jesus used over 69 times in the Gospels, and every time referring to himself. So who's the son of man? Well, here's how Daniel describes him in chapter 7. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. That's who Jesus is. And did you notice that the parable centers around the two questions, the two questions that the owner of the field has asked? The first question is this. Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? In other words, where did all the evil come from? What's the source of it? Were you duped or something? Did you make a mistake? What on earth are you doing? How come there's all this evil? 
If God is so good, if Christ is so mighty, then why is there so much evil in the world? It's a great question, isn't it? And it arises in every generation. Where does this evil come from? If the Messiah has come, if Jesus triumphed over evil on the cross, then why is evil still flourishing today? Even in Jesus' day, people assumed that when the kingdom came, when the Messiah appeared, he would blow the whistle and it would be game over for evil. But Jesus says, that's not what's going to happen. You see, Jesus' first advent, his first appearance on earth was without judgment. An ancient prophecy from Isaiah said that when the Messiah would come, he would proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus actually read that prophecy out loud in the synagogue one day. It's recorded in Luke chapter 4. But when Jesus got up and read from the scroll of Isaiah that day, he stopped halfway through the verse. He stopped right after saying the year of the Lord's favor. He didn't read the next bit and the day of vengeance of our God. Do you see? Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Grace comes now with Jesus. Judgment comes with Jesus later. That's what's happening on the earth. And did you notice? Did you notice the owner's reply to the first question. It's pretty short. In verse 28, he simply says, an enemy did this. That's it. That's all the explanation. An enemy did this. That's it. <laughs> How I would love to know so much more about that, wouldn't you? Why did he do it? What's he up to? How could you let this happen as the owner? How could you let the enemy do that? How could you let that happen? And why don't you do something about it now? Wouldn't you like to know so much more? But that's all we're told. An enemy did this. Then the second question comes. The servants ask, can we do something about the weeds then? Let us sort it for you. Do you want us to go and pull up all of the weeds and get rid of them? If we act now, we'll be able to get rid of the evil uh, and, and have it done and dusted. And again, there's a short answer. Jesus, the owner, answered, no. But this time, this time he gives an explanation. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Let both grow together until the harvest. So here is what on earth is happening. Evil will grow alongside good until the harvest. That's the teaching of Jesus. And oh, how we really need to grasp that piece of wisdom today. Is this world getting better or is it getting worse? Well, it's both. The world is getting better and it is getting worse at the same time. The good seed is growing and producing an abundant harvest. And the weeds are growing too. With every week that passes, they are larger and more deeply rooted than ever before. We are living in the day of God's grace, in the day of his favor. The day of judgment has not yet come. And until that day, this is what the kingdom will look like. Good wheat in a field laced with weeds. So what are we to do in response to all of this? What does this mean for us? Well, there are lots of things we can delve into in our midweek Bible study, but here are three important things, three important lessons. Firstly, be patient. Where has God planted you in his field? Where have you been sown? That's where he wants you. Don't be on some agenda of withdrawal from the world. There are no real ideal spots 
in this field. Wherever Christ sows his people, the enemy sows his weeds. So just bloom where you're planted. As we saw last week, if, we, uh, if all we knew of the, uh, of the apostle Peter was what was recorded in the Gospels, we'd be tempted to call him shallow ground, or in the words of this parable, he'd definitely be a weed, not wheat. And yet, he wasn't shallow ground after all. He was good soil. And he wasn't a weed. He was wheat. So be patient. As Augustine said, those who look like weeds today may be wheat tomorrow. Be patient. Secondly, be tolerant. Now, the word tolerance has been hijacked in our culture. It used to mean showing patience and forbearance towards people with whom you radically disagreed. But now it's used to mean affirming what others affirm. But there's no need for tolerance between people who affirm the same things. If you agree, what is there to tolerate? I read a tweet this week from a lady in a church in America who was complaining about something a certain minister, not her minister, had tweeted and then deleted. And she said that she didn't know if she could belong, not just to that church, but to that denomination any longer. She'd have to find a church where those kinds of things didn't happen. Well, I hope she finds that perfect church. I haven't found one yet. Tolerance is a wonderful Christian virtue. And it is needed where there are deep-seated disagreements. It means showing patience and forbearance toward people that you find really difficult. Jesus makes it clear that in this world, the wheat needs to grow alongside the weeds until the Son of Man comes. The mission of the church is sowing seeds, not pulling weeds. Honestly, we have a big enough challenge on our hands, trying to deal with the sin in our own hearts. It is not in our power or in our calling to root out the evil in the world. That is the work of the Son of Man, and he will do it when he comes. Be patient. Be tolerant. And thirdly, be expectant. You might think the worst. It might feel at the moment as if evil is winning and God is doing nothing about it. But know this, evil has a shelf life. Peter wrote, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Corey Ten Boom lived alongside some of the greatest evil the world has ever seen. And she suffered unspeakably in a Nazi concentration camp. She wrote this poem. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colours he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget that he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why the dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that we have examined this morning. 
how it searches us out, how it sets our age into perspective and makes us see life as it really is. Teach us, Lord, to be patient, tolerant, and expectant. The judge of all the earth will do what is right. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. My soul finds a rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I fix my heart on a righteousness. I look to him who hears me. Oh, praise him, hallelujah, my delight and my reward. Everlasting, never failing, my Redeemer, my God. Find a rest, my soul, in God alone. When evil seeks to take a hold, I'll cling to my salvation. But though riches come and riches go, don't set your heart upon them. The fields of hope in which I sow are harvested in heaven. on God alone and trust in Him completely with every day pour up my soul and He will prove His mercy though life is but a fleeting breath a sigh too brief to measure my King has crushed the curse of death and I am His forever the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with you this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen.